If you are an HR professional, business owner, or at the operations level trying to understand what people want, you may be struggling. Our systems have been shocked, practices have been questioned, and culture is the leading conversation. Let's learn how culture is created, sustained, and why it should be the leading conversation when discussing hiring, training, and retention. This is the foundation of any business, and it's time to address it. So tune in to Let's Talk HR, humanizing the conversation. We tackle topics that influencers of change need to understand and struggle to overcome every day, such as where to start and what the new workforce wants and how to attract and keep positive momentum going. I'm your host, Leanne Lovely. Captain William Toady, retired U.S. Navy, has more than 26 years of service in the U.S. Navy and 15 years in industry, accumulating in a role as CEO of a defense company. Today, he continues his journey as a sought-after consultant and authority on topics of military transition into industry, the monstrous September 11, 2001 terrorist attack on the Pentagon, and the unforgettable stories of World War II cruiser USS Indianapolis and her heroic crew. William, thank you so much for joining me today. I'm excited to have this conversation. I'm excited to be here, Leanne. Thank you for having me. So why don't you just start out by telling me a little bit about yourself? Wow. Um, well, I joined the Navy at age 17, wanting to become an astronaut. That didn't quite work out. I ended up at the Naval Academy after less than a year being enlisted mm -hmm. and graduated in 1979, went into submarines. I actually did make kind of a false move, the astronaut thing. I got nominated in 1987 and failed the physical so wow. <laughs> I had to return to submarine duty, which was fine. I had a great career in submarines, ended up commanding a submarine, USS Indianapolis. It was Commodore of Submarine Squadron 3 in Pearl Harbor and uh, had a great Navy career. Made the transition to industry in 2006, and boy, was it eye-opening. Wow. So you went from wanting to be in space to yeah. being in water. Yeah, you know, yeah, underwater. Underwater, Absolutely. right? Yeah. <laughs> underwater. Spent years of my life underwater. It was, uh, yeah, very different. Wow, it's is... actually much more like space than you can imagine. I used to tease my astronaut friends, the ones that didn't get kicked out, that you know we we the differential pressure on a submarine is one atmosphere every thirty three feet. So if you're four hundred feet down, that's many many atmospheres. Space only one atmosphere. You can't get more differential pressure than that because for going to a vacuum to one atmosphere. So the submarine is actually in a much harsher environment than a spacecraft. Wow. That's a fact that I did not know. Yeah. That's very, very interesting. Mm -hmm. That's that's absolutely amazing. So I, I, I've i always had this like idealistic, you know, image of what it would be like to be underwater. However, I also have this like utter fear of, being in an enclosed space so you've you've mm -hmm. got to walk me through like what was it like your first time going you know so under i do remember going to sleep for the very first time and the bunks on submarines are very small you got maybe two feet between your face and the hull above your you know, i was in the top rack talk bunk, bunk and so two feet above you is the hull and i remember on the other side of that bit of steel, there are hundreds of feet of water and all that pressure that's above you that, you know, just, I remember laying there thinking about that, but I was so tired, I just went straight to sleep. People who volunteer for submarine duties tend not to have issues with this stuff. So, and it's all volunteer, you can't be forced right. into submarines. So it wasn't a, a real issue for me. I do remember that one thought, put it to bed, you know, a decade of submarine duty and never had an issue with it. Right. Oh my God. That I, I don't know that I could even get myself to walk in a submarine when, when it was above water. I, I, mm. that we did have, I did have one experience when I was captain where we had a Senate staffer come on board for a ride. And as soon as we shut the hatches, she freaked out to the point where Mike Corman had to kind of, um, drug her and had to calm her down to to get her to because she wanted to climb out the hatch and we couldn't 
We couldn't let her do that. So we had to turn around, go back in. It was out of Pearl Harbor, go back in and drop her off. It was the only time in, like I said, over a decade of submarine duty where that ever happened. Right. Oh, my gosh. I, I, right. I, I, as much as I'm sure that somebody can set themselves up for like, this is what's going to happen. You don't know how you're actually mm-hmm. going to react when, right. when you physically right. are in that situation. Yep. In- interesting. So, okay. So you did, you were in, you were in for 26 years. Is that correct? That's right. Awesome. And now it went fast. It did. 26 it did, years. Yeah. It went fast. I never intended to stay in the Navy that long. In class of 79, our, our commitment after we graduated from Annapolis was over in 84, 1984. And our kind of our motto was out the door in 84. We thought we would be all be leaving the Navy as soon as our commitment was up. But I was given another uh, really good assignment to go to graduate school mm-hmm. and for free, right? And then another good assignment and then another one and another one. And suddenly, boom, I'm captain. Now I can't leave, right? That's that's really cool. Um, and it just turned out where suddenly I was in my mid-40s. And I said, holy cow, how did that go that fast? If I don't transition to industry now, I won't have enough time in my life left for a real second career, right. which is why I decided, okay, this has been good, but I do want to have a full second career in industry. I got to move now. And that's what caused me to jump when I did. So tell me about that. I mean, it, you spent basically, you, you know, two decades mm-hmm. plus, plus yeah, as a military man in, mm-hmm. in conditions that the majority of, I would say, not the majority, almost nobody in civilian life could possibly understand because mm-hmm. this is not, the, you know, the, the path you chose is not for the faint of heart Mm -hmm. um as i think we just kind of dove into a little bit there not extremely deep but it's not for the faint of heart i mean you're living in in a steel tube underwater Mm -hmm. with a nuclear reactor in that steel tube right exactly right right. (laughs) you know you you can't you 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 can't not be 100 percent aware of everything you're doing at at every moment you Mm -hmm. know of your career so now you're transitioning into civilian into the civilian world well it was it was an enormous transition way more difficult than i thought it would be the the military gives you transition training they're required by law actually to give you trans transition training as you get out and you assume i'll speak personally i assumed that the transition training was valid and good and it turns out it was just short of horrible. It misleads you in a whole bunch of different ways. And this is why I spend so much time talking to companies and HR professionals these days. Because my point is, there are great attributes that that veteran employee is going to bring the company. But there's a whole bunch of things that the veteran employee may think they know that they really don't, that might set them up for failure if the company isn't sensitive to it. And the strategy of throwing them into the deep end and hoping they can figure it out to swim is is not gonna work. And so what I try to do is help the company training teams, company HR professionals understand what the, the military veteran will and will not bring to their civilian job and help them understand how to close the gaps and, and this is one of the reasons I ended up writing my book, From CEO to CEO, because in my 16-year journey in industry, I started out as a director, ended up as CEO. Um, I saw thousands of military employees, and I saw way too many of them fail. Mm-hmm. And, and, and the failures, I was one of the first to see. Oh my, I almost failed in my transition. And so the lessons were repeatable. I mean, the, 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 the failures were occurring for the same reasons over and over and over again. And so what I try to do is write all those things down, starting with what I call the great lie. And the great lie is, is told to veterans as they're leaving the military, which is you know, the transition tr- trainers will tell them, you know, you, you've already been a leader in the military. 
and all your civilian company wants from you is good leadership. And, and if you can provide that level of leadership in your future job, you'll do just fine. And that's actually very bad advice because what it does is it sets the veteran up with an inappropriate degree of confidence. Number one, that the kind of leadership they might have exerted on active duty translates to industry, mm -hmm. and it often doesn't. And number two, the reason I call it the great lie, is it's certainly not all your future employees going to want from you, good leadership. You know, and it's not even true in the military. If, if it was true in the military, I could take a, a B-52 wing commander and put him in command of submarine, and as long as he's a good leader, it would have worked. But we know that's not the case, right? And, right? and in industry, you actually need to know something about what you're doing to succeed and good leadership's not gonna help you. Right. Well, and I guess here's the question, who is training the veterans who are transitioning into civilian, into the civilian world? Sadly, people who don't know what they're talking about. Right. They're good people, don't get me wrong, but the contracts are awarded to the lowest bidder. And just like any time that happens, you uh, bid teachers that you can that will allow you to pay them a low enough wage to win the contract. Mm -hmm. And those teachers are not going to have the kind of experience necessary to actually know what they're talking about. I mean, you would think that the people who are training those people should be people like you. But they, they couldn't afford right. people like me right, right on the contract. And right. so it's systemic, these failures. And that's the point I make. All of these failures are systemic. The military is required by law to give the training, but the law doesn't require it to be good training. Right. So they check the block and then they and then the, the veteran ends up joining a company and they might exhibit bad leadership behaviors, mm -hmm. in which case HR is going to say, what do we do about this now? Right. Or, and what I also find is non-veteran managers mm -hmm. are afraid to have those difficult conversations with their veteran employees right. because they think, who am I to tell this guy who commanded a company in, in the army that he's not exhibiting good leadership behaviors, right? right. He's, he's not going to take that well. So rather than have that conversation with him, they let them fail right? because and, it's easier. Right. I mean, it, there's no denying that, that there are many veterans who have been left out in the cold limited support. I have seen it in my career. Somebody who's in staffing, mm -hmm. we have veterans who come to us. I'm struggling to find a job. I'm struggling to find a position in the civilian world that translates to what I was doing in the military. I have a ton of experience, but I don't know what that role looks like in the civilian world. Because and in many MOSs, in many military, um, you know, training qualification, professional qualifications, do not translate well right. to civilian industry. In 2011, I was assigned to a White House working group on certifying military you know, people for civilian industry. Mm -hmm. And it was President Obama's um, initiative. And I was very proud to be part of this working group. But it was easy for some fields like IT, and medicine for, you know, corpsmen, medics, to get them EMT and paramedic certification. Some of them translated very, very well. Mm -hmm. But then there were other disciplines in the military. There was absolutely no civilian analog for. What are you going to do with it? Infantrymen, right? right? What professional certification is that person going to make? Mm -hmm. So there, there are absolutely coping skills, you know, as we say in the military. But people in who've gone through hard deployments understand how to embrace the suck. So nothing the company's going to throw at them is going to, um, you know, phase them. Right. They're going to be able to put up with the hardship. They'll be fine. So there's great coping skills, which are useful, mm -hmm. but those skills by themselves aren't enough. Right. Right. No. And to your point, somebody who's in infantry, it's, it's extremely sad that they were, very well respected in the military. And then you find them years later working for minimum wage at a factory. And you're like, well, is this what we're, we're telling our veterans that is, is available to them when they 
transition into civilian life. Yeah. And One of the things I started saying to companies, to employers, is stop saying thank you for your service. And that surprises a lot of people coming from a veteran, because frankly, I like to hear people say that. Mm -hmm. So why am I saying that? It's an empty, vacuous remark with nothing behind it. It makes the person saying it feel good. And it, may, it makes the person hearing it maybe feel good too. But it doesn't do a thing. And I'm saying this only to employers. I, I'm not saying this to the general public. Mm -hmm. The general public Please do say thank you for your service. But employers, it doesn't do a thing to help that military person become a better employee. In fact, if anything, it draws a broader line between the veteran employees and the non-veteran employees. Right. So rather than say this empty statement, do something meaningful, meaningful that's going to help them transition into a better employee. That's really well said. Because you're right. And here, this made me think of a story. Um, and this was not one of my employees. This was actually, I was having a conversation. Obviously, I have a lot of conversations about HR. Sure. Um, <laughs> but somebody said to me, um, they were telling me a story about an employee that was working, a veteran employee that was mm. working at a company. And, and they didn't know how to coach her. She was She was doing okay on the job. But... The manager came up to her and said, you know, some of the employees, she was managing a couple of people, some of the employees are struggling to work with you. We'd like you to smile more. <laughs> and, and, and she, she was like, okay, well, I, you know, I'm just doing my job, you know, mm -hmm. you know, I, I'm just trying to, that was their response to how we're going to coach her. Why don't you mm -hmm. smile more? Right. And, and again, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. And eventually they, they ended up letting her go because that was the feedback they gave. We, we want you to smile more. People will respond to you better. This is exactly the problem. The company, rather than treat, treating the veteran just like any other employee, treats them differently. Right. Would you say that to a non-veteran employee? And, and then once... So there's a differentiation mm -hmm. in the kind of feedback the, the manager and HR gives to the veteran employee. And then there's a much higher um, probability that rather than giving them meaningful coaching and feedback like they would do with any other employee in the performance reviews, they basically say, hmm, I'm just going to let them fail. And people wonder why the veteran suicide rate is so high and, mm -hmm. and why there's so much stress and transition anxiety for veterans. These are exactly the reasons these things happen. Right. You, I don't know if there's if there is a assumed like you're a, you're you're a military person. You you should know how to do this or if it's a fear in the H.R. What you were saying of, well, I don't want to insult them because they are because they are a veteran, but we're talking about two completely dis two different disciplines, military, which right. is an extremely structured, extremely, you understand you were not only trained in your MOS, you were, mm -hmm. you were trained in the disciplines of the military through basic training. And then mm -hmm. you continue to get training and continue to get very clear, concise expectations of your job on a regular basis. Mm -hmm. If yeah. you just, when I, I mean, it, it's so when you, I'm assuming when this veteran, and again, I, I say I'm assuming because I don't know. Uh, some of my listeners know that I, you know, served, but I did not serve very long, um, and that was over 20 plus years ago. Um, so I, I never experienced any of this. I was, you know, mm -hmm. um, so I'm assuming. I mentioned that I almost failed in my first job. Um, happily, my my boss, my boss's boss, actually, who was my mentor, uh, had that really difficult conversation with me. In fact, I remember the words, the exact words he used was, Bill, you're screwing this up. That was the best thing he could have ever said to me. And in the counseling that followed, one of the things he said was, and I put this in my book, Right. You need to learn how to live with ambiguity. And that was a concept that never occurred to me. Right. I was a I was a 
captain of a submarine. It was it was either you know it was black or it was white. There were no shades of gray. We're gonna it's right or it's wrong. There was a chain of command. You followed the chain of command. I was Commodore. Same thing. Learn to live with ambiguity was a concept that was foreign to me, but that one simple expression taught me so much mm -hmm. and reset my kind of frame of reference in ways that allowed me to turn it around and succeed where I'd been failing. Uh, I, right. That, and and that's, a, that's an extremely powerful point. There is no ambiguity in the military. Yeah. It, 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 well, there is, but we, we try to pretend there isn't. Right. <laughs> yes. We try to turn ambiguity into certainty. Yes. So we're going to make a decision. What is it? You know, and, and it's kind of like that. Um, the, the notion of, in fact, I talk about, um, you know, situational leadership in the book, mm -hmm. you know, and, and some, and I do imply in the book, I don't name which services are better than others, but some transitioning, some people transitioning from what some services, some military services understand that, you know, situational leadership concept better than other military services. And I'll let people, I'll let your listeners decide which services are more regimented and which are more kind of flexible and, um, you know, adaptable. But there's truth to that. Mm -hmm. And when I was in the process of hiring people, I considered that, you know, and I would say to people who I knew were coming from a background where they were going to be excessively regimented, I would have that conversation with them. And I would say, you understand now that this is a different environment. And what you what worked for you, a great book I refer to every everybody to, what got you here won't get you there. Mm -hmm. This is the title of the book. And I refer that book to you know, everybody from the military that I would hire. And I would say, your success will depend on your degree of adaptability. Right. You know, this is before I wrote my own book. Now I refer them to my book. But anyway, um, <laughs> but th that is just absolutely HR people, hiring managers and managers need to understand that, that this that the biggest thing they can help their veterans do is understand the concept of situational leadership, um, you know, the need to kind of get immersed in the success profile of the company which is going to be very different and the need to help the veteran understand the mission because veterans are going, always going to be very mission oriented. And when you're on active duty, it's easy to understand the mission, mm -hmm. defending the country. When you join a company, cynical veterans start thinking, well, my mission now is to put money in my boss's pocket. <laughs> That's not the mission, right? <laughs> right. That is not the mission, but it may not be obvious to the veteran that that's not the mission. Mm -hmm. And so companies go, can go a long way by helping the veteran understand what the real mission is. And how many companies do you think actively try to understand and really help these veterans? I mean, do, with the companies that you've spoken with, because again, mm -hmm. I, I work with and I, and I will and I see all the time, you know, veteran friendly or, you know, mm -hmm. veterans wanted. But then often and, and there's one company um, and, and I'm obviously I'm not going to name names, but there's you know mm -hmm. one company that, oh, we're veteran friendly, we're veteran friendly. But they they don't make any attempt to do anything differently with those individuals. Companies that consider themselves veteran friendly can recite to you how many veterans they hire in a given year. So I asked them, okay, how many of those veterans that you hired are still with you after five years? And they fail open. They have no idea. And so they, unless you can answer that question, unless the number, the percentage, it compares to the percentage of non-vets that have, are still with you after five years, mm -hmm. you're not veteran friendly. And answer the question about which companies do a good job, the default you know, wisdom would say, well, the defense companies, because they are the closest to the veteran community or the active duty community. Mm -hmm. And the truth is defense companies are more likely to pigeonhole veterans 
into business development like positions and like propagates like so people think that that's where the veterans belong they belong in those business development i was in i went into pnl which was a high risk high reward right um transition from active duty but it worked out for me it doesn't work out for a lot of people but the defense companies tend to, to pigeonhole veterans in those business development positions and then the veterans in the business development positions think that other veterans that they hire ought to come into business development and they end up like not assimilating their veterans often as well as a company that's not a defense company hmm. that says well we got talent here what where can we best use this talent we're not selling to the military so that doesn't make sense mm -hmm. you have to put them in sales so where can we best use them and, and as long as they go in understanding the strengths and weaknesses of the veterans that they're, employ they're employing, which is why I recommend that company managers read my book as well, then they're going to do fine. So tell me about your book. Okay. The book is titled From CEO to CEO, A Practical Guide for Transitioning from Military to Industry Leadership. Because it describes my journey from commanding officer CEO to chief executive officer of Spartan Corporation CEO. And it, it, when you read the book, it's written at, for, as me talking to veterans who are thinking of transitioning out of the military. When I wrote it, though, I had in mind that this would be a, a book that non-veteran, you know, corporate managers, HR people ought to read. And when you read it, what you're re what you're gonna the experience you're gonna get is one veteran counseling another. It's like you're listening into that conversation, and you're listening to me tell those veterans, "Here's what you're gonna be good at. Here's what you're gonna screw up if you're not careful." Mm -hmm. And so I think it gives insight into corporate leaders who haven't served um, as to what the strengths of those veteran employees are gonna be, and what weaknesses need to be mitigated if you want to make the veteran a successful employee. Right. You know, <clears throat> this reminds me, and, and I'm not comparing these two by any means, um, so please, I, I don't want anybody to think, oh, she's comparing, but this reminds me, I interviewed um, a while back some individuals who work with um, people who are you know, previously incarcerated coming into society, and mm -hmm. it, it, there's there's similarities in the sense that obviously not similarities in the fact that one person was in prison and the other person was in the military at all. But there are similarities in the sense that when somebody's coming out of the military back into society or into civilian life and somebody's coming out of prison into c civilian life, um, there there's you can draw similarities in the sense that military and in prison, y you have structure that mm -hmm. you no longer have in civilian life. There are certain things that all of a sudden you as an individual have to remember about just daily living moving mm -hmm. from especially if you're you know living on a um, military base full time and you know you're you got your wake up call every morning you've got your three square meals at the same time every single day you've got you know everything you need basically on that military base and then all of a sudden you're thrust into just having to <laughs> have an alarm clock having to do you know and then from obviously from prison again everything is you know completely designed for you those similarities mm -hmm. all of a sudden you can you can draw some and you would think that as a society we would get smarter about that we have groups for aa we have groups for why aren't we why aren't we setting up places where individuals can go and meet and be like, okay, here's what I'm struggling with. I'm, you know, I just recently came out of, you know, active duty, just want to come in and have a conversation with all of my fellow veterans who are in this area and talk about what are you struggling with? What are you struggling? And be able to talk through some of those things on a personal level, because it's not just about a job. It's right. also can be what, are you struggling with family issues? Because right. these things, especially people who have been deployed, people mm -hmm. who have been in war zones, people who have, 
I mean, it, it goes so much deeper and so much, you know, psychologically, the, those things too. Mm-hmm. You would think that we would have, you know, a landing pad that goes far beyond just, okay, here's your walking papers, enjoy yeah. life. And yep. well, it's funny you mentioned that because I did have a veteran once say to me, there ought to be a halfway house for people transitioning out of the military. Um, and he didn't say we're like prisoners, but you know, the, um, <laughs> right. the concept is the same. It's what you're trying to say. Yes. There are local groups, the veterans administration tries to do this, but they're overwhelmed. Mm-hmm. They're way overwhelmed. There are local groups, the VFW and, and groups like that will, yep. will have gatherings that try to help people. And there are other organizations like the military officers association of America and, and organizations like that. They do try to have gatherings of people that are in the process of transitioning to help them talk through issues. Employers can help too, though, because, you know, when I was growing up in the mid 2000s in my first industry job, we had these things called employer resource groups or ERGs. And we had them for um, black engineers and American, you know, we had one for American Indian, you know, employees and, and things like that did not have one for veterans. Interesting, right? right? We were not seen as one of those um, DNI groups, but in fact, we should be. The veterans should be thought of as a you know, diversity inclusion group mm-hmm. because there is a transition. They have similar transition challenges that can be aided by, you know, a kind of a transition process. And so I do encourage companies to create ERGs for veteran employees, Mm -hmm. just like they would for, you know, other groups. Right. No, I, I absolutely, that's, I mean, that should be one of the first, it frustrates me that the very people who are defending our country are the people who are thought of last. Yeah. Yeah. We get used to that though, don't we? Um, Again, that's why, again, that's part of the message with stop saying thank you for your service and start to saying something that's meaningful. Right. Start doing something that's meaningful. You really want to thank them, help them in their transition process. Mm-hmm. And so that's the message I try to leave with companies. Right. So you work with, when do companies typically engage you and, you know, how do they engage you and, you know, the engine of, of integra- interaction in 2022 is LinkedIn. Right. And so you know, they find me on LinkedIn and they say, hey, look, we're trying to revise our veteran transition and training p- curriculum mm-hmm. for new employees. Um, would you, you know, uh, w- would you be willing to help that kind of thing? And I, to date, I've been doing all of this kind of work pro bono as my as the demand signal increases, I don't know how much longer I'll be able to do it because just simply because a matter of who do you help the most? I mean, right. who do you help first? There's an inclination that I'll help companies with the higher numbers because mm-hmm. you can affect more people with, you know, the same footprint or same uh, engagement time. But, but again, I haven't reached that point yet. Wow. You've, this has all been pro bono that you've been assisting companies and. It has, that's... you know, it's one of the things I, I don't say much, but you know, I wrote this book at my own cost. I spent years, two years writing it and paid um, a lot of money to have it edited. And it was a hybrid publication where the publisher paid part and I paid part. And and everything I'm doing is, I'm never going to, not doing this to make money, obviously. I'm doing it to try to give back. Um, but the, um, in fact, it will never break even on the thing, but, the, but I, it's so important, right? I'm trying to put my time where my mouth is and, and, and do give this give back. And I'm happy to help companies um, improve their veteran transition training, uh, you know, if they're serious about it. And I do want to make sure they're serious about it before I'm willing to, to engage because there are companies that are serious and uh, I want to spend my time where it's going to do the most good. Right. No, that's, and that's absolutely, I I mean, I, that is absolutely positively amazing because like I said earlier, 
um, like you've said, there are so many veterans out there. And, and my, um, my partner at my day job, her husband is a military man. Um, she, you know, she, I've seen her travel around um, because he gets relocated and, and she's, you know, and he is, um, he's Navy. So mm -hmm. um, he's, you know, out there. And, my family, and, my family yeah. moved 15 times yep. in my active duty career. <laughs> yeah. So, I understand. so right now she's in San Diego um, and she's hoping to actually make her way back to um, back around to, you know, this area where I'm at. But mm -hmm. again, um, she, because she has that connection and she understands as a recruiter, she's able to help translate some of the military or veteran people um, what they've done in the military to the civilian, you know, the civilian world. Unfortunately, mm -hmm. you know, after you do that step, it's, you know, you send them to an employer and, and then, you know, you have to step back and say, okay, I hope this employer is going to be, you know, able to, you know, help them. And, and I've seen, you know, I, I've sent some people to companies where they had, they were, a let me see, they had the, the automatic, um, uh, nail guns, you know, mm -hmm. the, the, the individual walked into the facility and people were using nail guns. And I think he practically ran out the door because again, mm -hmm. this person was in a combat situation. And I don't know if you've ever heard nail guns going off. It sounds just like a, sure it sounds just yeah. like a gun. Um, mm -hmm. you know, so I have, I've personally seen the effects of just sending individuals to interviews or seeing mm -hmm. individuals in jobs or hearing the stories of individuals looking for jobs because they they're struggling to find ones that translate to what they've done or, you know, being fired because they didn't smile too much or they didn't right, smile yeah. enough. I, you know, and my heart breaks because again, these individuals signed up and no matter what they did, Mm -hmm. they still signed up and put their, you know, potentially could have put their life on the line to defend our country. And now yeah. are being left out in the cold with that limited amount of support when they're ready to transition back into civilian life. Yeah. And that to me is not acceptable. I agree. I worked with a lot of headhunters in my industry career and I found myself spending a lot of time with the headhunters be to train them mm -hmm. on how to, how to train the um, candidates that they were working with. And if I spend some time doing that now as well. I won't say that I'm doing that pro bono for a big head. On. You know, I think hydric and struggles can afford me. But anyway, um, the point I'm making is my, my challenge to the headhunter is, you know, you, you've sent me a candidate, I hired him, and then boom, you know where to be found when they turn out not to work out. Mm -hmm. And, um, I expect you to be invested in this decision, in, in this candidate, right? Right. And in order to do that, you need to understand how to truly measure how, you know, what they're going to, the, their probability of success in the role. Mm -hmm. And so I'm happy to help you evaluate um, military candidates and help you prepare the military candidates for the civilian life because the, the government is not going to do it. And again, that's the, when I pound my, the table, when I talk to companies, I'm going to say, you, you think you're going to get somebody that's ready to transition to your company, and they're not. Right. The government is failing in that mission. Right. So it's up to you. And now is the time that we, we are lacking people to go to work. We're lacking mm -hmm. skilled people to go to work. Right. And these individuals want to go to work and i gotta tell you the military has a pretty strict uh, policy about no showing your job mm -hmm. these are going to be individuals who show up every day yeah absolutely They're, i mean mm -hmm. so if you want an individual who's going to show up put forth the effort every single day and really is hungry to to go to work and provide for their family this is the kind of candidate that you want now, are they going to come with maybe a little bit of baggage or a little bit of extra training because they're transitioning? Yeah, you may have to put a little effort in up front. Yeah, I, I would characterize but, it as things that might need to be unlearned. I, absolutely. But you're, you've got it exactly right. 
they're going to have wonderful attributes that you won't find when you hire somebody off the street. Right. Okay. That comes with a counterpoint that they may not, not will, but may have things that need to be unlearned. And as long as you understand that and help them unlearn it, mm -hmm. it's going to work out great. Yep. Yeah, no, I, and, and it, like I said, it's a, it's a pain point and a frustration for me and obviously for you, otherwise you wouldn't be on this mission. You wouldn't have written mm -hmm. this book. You wouldn't be, you know, talking about this. Um, and so, yeah, this is a, a great topic that needs to be talked about more and employers need to, to invest in, in understanding what this means. So, um, yeah, so again, the book is From CO to CEO, A Practical Guide for Transitioning from Military to Industry Leadership. So check out that book. I, um, I'm going to check that out, too. So Thank you, Leanne. Yeah, so um, we are we are coming um, pretty close to time, but I want to get in the um, the question of the season. If you could go back to your younger self and give yourself advice, when would you go back, and what advice would you give yourself? Geez, I think I would go back to my seventeen year old self and say, accept the fact you're not going to be an astronaut, but your life is going to be terrific anyway. So just embrace it and drive forward with as much vigor as you can. That's that's awesome. Now I gotta ask, seven mm -hmm. you were seventeen years old when you went in. Yes. Did you come from a military family? No. So, no, not at all. Okay. So no. now I, I enlisted at seventeen. My parents had to sign mm -hmm. me away. Yep. So I got what 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 made you decide that the military life was for you? Well, I mean, the truth is in the 1970s and the Vietnam War was still going on, mm -hmm. my mother was dead set against this. Um, now the Vietnam War was winding down and the draft had just ended. And she said, I've been worried all these years about you getting drafted and the draft ends and you enlist. Mm -hmm. And so she went crazy. But the, the truth was I couldn't afford any of the colleges I wanted to get into, right? right. I wanted a high-end college and we lived in Youngstown, Ohio, outside of Youngstown, Ohio. I didn't want to go to Youngstown State, but that was all I could afford. And so the military provided, right? And so I was very happy about that. And, you know, it, 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 in, in those days, that was the only way to become an astronaut too, right? You needed to be a military pilot. And so that was kind of part of the plan. So it all came together and it worked out. So I... Um... What movie is that? I, I can't think. I'm th I'm I'm sitting here looking at you and I'm picturing you mm -hmm. as a, this young William with, you know, dressing up. There's a movie and I can't think of what it is. The 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 little boy who's, you know, putting on the astronaut, uh, you know, costume and staring at the stars and and you know, I'm sorry. I, I know. I'm I that's, that's pretty much well, the way I was. Right. You know, during <laughs> that's that time. That's a pretty apt description. Yeah. During yeah. that time, I think that was like the number one thing everybody wanted to be an astronaut. Yeah. I was, um, you know, I think I was 11 or 12 when Neil Armstrong set yep. foot on the moon, watched it live. And boy, oh boy, that was motivating. Thank God for that. Because it put a fire in my belly to, I was a physics major at the academy and, you know, to, to, to really do well in school mm -hmm. and to study hard. And, um, and it really set the stage for my life. So I think everybody needs something to motivate them. Mm -hmm. I'm sad for people who don't have that something that drives them. And for me, that's what it was. Okay. And here's one, one more follow up. Sure. So, so you go now you're in the deep, deep. I mean, how deep can you go in, in a summary? We, it's classified, but we say greater than 800 feet. Okay. So you had to have seen some, crazy things right yes so yes. what is the craziest thing that you can you tell me what's the crazy <laughs> obviously it doesn't have to be classified no. i don't know like the craziest thing i i can think of i cannot talk about um uh, let's see what what's the craziest thing i can talk about i'm not sure i know um as far as on a submarine right right um i was in the pentagon on 9-11 that yeah, wasn't was, crazy that was very sad right yes but um but you know uh, no, I can't think of anything crazy. The story I told you about the lady who went crazy after we shut the hatch, we weren't even submerged yet. Um, oh my God. That, that's probably the craziest thing. Because right. you can't tell. Once the hatch goes shut, you can't tell if you're underwater or not. 
as far as you know right. once you submerge it's no, no i know difference. i have this yeah. idea in my head that like oh there's windows everywhere there's no windows <laughs> I know. Yeah. no windows on a submarine sorry it's a warship no right. <laughs> glass is not good for a warship oh somebody hey don't throw a rock you might break the window <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. Oh, that's terrible. <laughs> and that's right. And that's to take this to a serious moment. You were mm. you were at um the Pentagon during September 11th. Um right. my god, I I don't even know how to um and this is at the moment where I say thank you for your service and sir I mean deepest thank you for, you know, everything that you have been through and survived and uh, that's just i can't imagine the horrors of that day and and the people and every the things that everybody experienced that is um yeah you, you do have a lot of survivor's guilt i lived and a lot of my friends didn't but you know you, you, you get through it and um you know it was, it was a tough day and the days that followed were equally tough i was in, put in charge of the navy's recovery effort on september 12th and so the days that followed were equally um, tough. But, um, you know, I, I talk about it every year around the anniversary just so people remember. You know, I call the Pentagon the forgotten 9-11. Everybody forgets that a plane hit us, too, and because right. uh, not as many people died. New York deserves the attention it gets. But um, to the families that lost loved ones in the Pentagon, it's no less um, right. you know, tragic. Yeah. No. And that's... I'm, um, my heart goes out to, to you and everybody that you lost and everybody that was involved in that. So, okay. So wrapping up, if somebody wanted to reach out to you, um, it's to, you know, talk with you about your book or to reach out to you, you know, just how would they go about doing that? Well, they can, they can email me through my website and the website is William Toti. Toti is spelled T O T I dot com william com, and the book is available everywhere it's an audio book it's in you know apple books it's in it's on amazon kindle everything so it's easy to find um and you can email me via my website excellent william this has been such an amazing conversation i think that you know what you do and um you know advocating for veterans is just an amazing thing um so i really appreciate that you took the time to come on and um you know talk with me today well, thanks for having me. It's a very important subject. I'm so glad you're, you're you know, talking about it. So thank you. Thank you again for listening to Let's Talk HR. I appreciate your time and support. Without you, the audience, this would not be possible. So don't forget that if you enjoyed this episode, to follow us, like us, or share us. Have a wonderful day.